Sure, I mean, I'm going to be reflecting on Afghanistan's peace process, on the current, current kind of status play, looking at some of the challenges and obstacles um, that are involved moving forwards, uh, but also some of the opportunities that we can capitalize on, um, which hopefully can pave the way towards a peace process in Afghanistan. How important is Afghanistan to the world now? It's a really difficult question. Um, I think that Afghanistan is not on the agenda as much as it has been um, or as much as it should be. Um, but obviously with a revitalized US approach with some impetus and momentum behind a potential peace track, uh, particularly between the US and the Taliban, um, we might see at least a kind of revitalized interest in the country. Brilliant, thank you very much. Very I'm very much uh, looking forward to a constructive debate about many issues related to security, development and prosperity in Afghanistan and in the region. So it is a good forum and provide actually a good opportunity for all of us to discuss some of the critical issues that impact lives. How would you describe the real situation in Afghanistan today? Uh, security situation is still challenging, but overall life has improved tremendously and we are preparing for a presidential election soon. How do you see the future of the Afghan people are determined to build a safe, secure and stable Afghanistan for the sake of Afghanistan and the region. Thank you. And finally, your message uh, to all the viewers who are watching this program on Afghanistan. Uh, we appreciate the support that the countries around us have provided to us and we appreciate the goodwill that exists for the Afghan people. We would like to be uh, to re-establish Afghanistan as a prosperous and peaceful country. So there will be opportunity for everyone to benefit from peace in the region. Thank you. Just one final question I forgot to ask you, the important one is, how do you value India uh, as your friend? India is the most important partner in the region, not only provided critical economic assistance, but building human capital in Afghanistan by providing educational opportunity to the Afghans. Most importantly, India is increasingly becoming an important market for Afghan products, which we appreciate very much. Uh, so we continue, uh, we, we look uh, to expand our relations, which goes by a millennium. The relation between Afghanistan and India is, is a relation, civilizational relation. The ties are historic and critical and will continue to expand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Thank you. Yes, I've been uh, working in and on Afghanistan for, for quite a few years now. My, my topic today will be, I'm going to try to uh, discuss what kind of peace we should expect in Afghanistan if we will get peace. So I'm not going to discuss so much whether peace will come or not, but what kind of peace we should expect. Thank you. Well, of course, it's a, it's a deeply uh, important topic to Western security, but it's one that sadly has fallen off the radar over the past number of years. Um, as we've seen the increase of ISIS activity in Afghanistan and an increase in Taliban-led attacks, I think it's uh, important for us as the international community to come together to continue to support the Afghan nation and society. Thank you. Finally, how do you value India's role in, uh, for the future of Afghanistan? Well, I absolutely think that India has a very strong role, not only in the provision of security or some sort of relationship with Kabul and, and New Delhi, but also in terms of providing development aid and even infrastructure uh, cooperation. Of course, we'll see many nations uh, doing the same in Afghanistan, but India's long history and close uh, borders to Afghanistan give it, I think, a, a very large role. Well, this is such an important subject, but the risk is that it's becoming obscured and forgotten about because there's so many other really important geopolitical issues happening. So we're really delighted that the ambassador is here because he can tell us exactly what is going on. We've got Imran Khan going to Kabul shortly. We've got uh, elections happening next month. We've had the Americans have with a meeting in Doha and a new representative of the, of the State Department negotiating, so there's a lot happening at the moment. Um, I'm going to be talking about the importance of the Chabahar port, particularly uh, for Afghanistan. Afghanistan needs to have a port that allows it to have freedom of commerce that's independent of Pakistan. And when the Obama administration was wrapping up, we were in a very different relationship with Iran. President Trump has made dealing with Iran very difficult. So I'm going to be talking about the need to protect Chabahar, 
from the intentions of President Trump. How do you see India's role in the future of Afghanistan? So the, this is really important, right? So India has been a big stakeholder in Chabahar. It's sent, I think, like, what, seven shipments so far of several hundred thousand, well, several hundred thousands uh, of tons of wheat to Afghanistan. So I think India is going to be, is obviously a very important stakeholder in Afghanistan, and India has been a very important stakeholder to Chabahar. And so I'm hoping that India is actually going to get the concession to continue um, operating in Chabahar, but we'll see. I'd like to welcome you all to the seminar today hosted by the Democracy Forum on the future of Afghanistan. Uh, we're very honored that His Excellency uh, Tayyip Jawad, the Afghan ambassador to the United Kingdom, has set aside time in his busy schedule to address the seminar. Welcome, sir. Thank you. I'm very grateful to the team at the Democracy Forum for conceiving the seminar topic and arranging for such a distinguished panel of experts to be drawn from all over the world, some arriving this morning, for your edification. We're particularly appreciative that the University of London has allowed us to use this lecture theatre. The present situation of the Afghan people is a recurrent concern for the Democracy Forum and its sister publication, Asian Affairs Magazine. Several seminars, which I've attended in recent years, have focused on Afghanistan's relations with its neighbors and the consequence of global power politics for its internal security. Sir, your country is faced by a unique set of challenges that reflect and reinforce the circumstances of its historical geography. There are very few countries in the world which have had to adapt to such a pivotal role. In the 19th century, the British decided that Afghanistan represented a geopolitical risk to their hegemony in South Asia. It may be argued that their attempts to lessen this risk led to disaster. Lord Lansdowne, the Viceroy of India from 1884 to 1894, 1888 to 1894, saw a vacuum when he looked at Afghanistan. He wrote, in political geography, in political geography nature abhors a vacuum. If one thing is certain, any spaces left vacant upon our Indian frontiers will be filled by others if we do not step in ourselves. Indeed, these fateful words tragically have influenced the evolution of your country over the last 150 years. The year before Lansdowne gave his speech, the British government concluded a treaty in Kabul the Durand Line Agreement, and I have a copy of the original agreement in my bag, which I will show you afterwards. A line of control running for 1,500 miles, separating Afghanistan from British India. It forms, of course, the present-day boundary with Pakistan. It is still unclear if the line was intended to be an international boundary or a buffer zone. But we know for sure that it was greeted with apprehension by the Afghan government. In 1892, Abdul Rahman Khan, the Emir, wrote to Lansdowne to express his concerns about the risk of imposing a border. He wrote, if you should cut the frontier tribes out of my dominions, they will neither be of use to you or to me. You will always be engaged in fighting or other trouble with them, and they will always go on plundering. In your cutting away from me these tribes, you will injure my prestige in the eyes of my subjects and will make me weak, and my weakness is injurious to your government. To many, Abdul Rahman's words seem chillingly prescient, anticipating, as they do, the Russian invasion of your country in 1979 and the opening of the coalition operations 22 years later. Next year, you'll be celebrating the centenary of the Royal Assembly Treaty the agreement reached with the British in 1919 that ended the Third Afghan War 
and guaranteed your country's independence as a sovereign nation state. But it is a matter of regret that next year, Afghanistan is almost certain still to be hosting coalition forces in the 18th year of continual military operations, a period of time equivalent to the Second World War fought three times over. We're all aware of the ethnic and ideological fragmentation in your country that impedes unification under a single Afghan government. But it was encouraging to witness the overlapping ceasefires which took place in the celebration of Ramadan and Eid the holidays this year. And equally, it is hoped that the opportunity to hold parliamentary and district elections next month portends a new chapter in Afghan democracy. The, re the recent United States mission to Doha, led by Alice Wells, and the appointment of Mr. Kalazad as the United States Special Envoy, perhaps also provides an indication that a negotiated settlement may be possible. But if one looks at the recent history of, Af of Afghanistan, facile optimism seems out of place. Perhaps, at last now, we may be able to see a glimpse of hope in the future. <laughs> Thank you very much for the kind introduction and setting up actually this stage for a good, productive discussion. I really appreciate it. Uh, so much balance, especially some dear colleagues and friends that I miss for some time and I see them again, especially uh, Bonnie and Sina. So good to see you all here. And, uh, and thank you very much for providing me an opportunity to start actually a constructive discussions about the challenges ahead. I think it's an ambitious agenda to talk about all our challenges in one afternoon, but good so luck. So I, I will be listening in and learning actually as you discuss our uh, challenges. Um, there is a series of discussion over a range of issues, and as I mentioned myself and my colleagues from the embassy, we look forward actually to your recommendations and the debates and discussions. I would like to be specific, uh, taking the opportunity of being here at the university to speak about the challenges of peace and reconciliation in Afghanistan, because this is a subject that's of interest to us, to our friends uh, here in the UK, of, for which we, we are very grateful for the military and uh, development and humanitarian assistance that the UK has provided. I think those assistance has helped stabilize Afghanistan, but also provided uh, assurances for the security in the larger region, including the UK. So I will, in, in, in talking about peace and reconciliation, and again, having someone that I call it, who has been closely involved in these issues, both as an expert on the subject matter, but also as a very long-standing friend of Afghanistan, so I would like to provide an alternative kind of to the traditional wisdom that exists about how to proceed about the peace process and also try to, to explain why we are hearing actually conflicting reports as my lord indicated that Afghan Taliban are meeting with the Afghan government, Afghan Taliban are meeting with the Americans in Qatar, Afghan Taliban are invited in Moscow, Moscow says no they're not, Afghan government says we will meet with them, Taliban says we meet with everyone but Afghan government. What is this confusion about? Is it something unusual? And so that's why I will, I will discuss in a more frank, in a more analytical way, what does it take to, uh, to reach Peace and, and why you are getting this conflicting report and, and, and it should be should be worried, should be disappointed, or this is part of the game. That's how it's done, that's how it works. So and again, just recently you heard you heard about meetings being postponed in Moscow, meetings possibly taking place in Qatar or, or other places. So uh, I emphasize that what I'm talking about is based on my involvement in this process since probably 2004 when the initial contacts started with certain elements of the Taliban. And also, I served in Colombia and I, I worked with uh, President Uribe and, and I had an opportunity to travel there and to see and observe how this was done and how difficult it was. So, um, consider actually my discussion, my personal opinion more or less, then the position of the Afghan government in each subject matter. 
A question that we've been asked always is, do you have a peace plan? Yes, we do. Every successful peace plan is a classified peace plan. And we do have this, with scenarios, with detailed discussion at the highest level of the government. And we also have a peace plan put forward by the Peace Council. But keep in mind, any target peace plan is a PR document. It's not a, a, road, uh, a, 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 a roadmap to the peace. You do need to have a PR document for peace process to strengthen national consensus, to give assurance. Because as soon as you talk about peace, there will be people that will, will not like it. In Afghanistan specifically, women will be concerned. There will be minorities that will be concerned. So you do have to have two approach. A real peace plan is, is, a, is a covered peace plan, is, is, a, is a classified peace plan. And now the second question is, do you really need a peace plan? Of course, when we listen to our international partners, they all say, yes, yes, you have to have a peace plan. And that's why, occasionally, Afghanistan put forward a different peace plan. But again, my personal opinion, seeing this in different parts of the world, no, you don't need a peace plan. You need a peace concept. You should know what you are trying to achieve through the peace process. It doesn't make sense if you come up with a comprehensive peace plan or the other party is not interested to talk to you. It's like, I, mean, I, I joke about always planning a wedding when you have not proposed to the girl yet. I don't know if, if she is going to accept it or not. So this is, you start actually a contact, you, you sit down with the other side and then develop a comprehensive peace plan. You have to have a contact. Because if you put forward a peace plan with all the details without the other party showing serious interest, you undermine consensus among your own people. People that say, wait a minute, what are you doing? They, they just killed 70 people on the street in Kabul, and then you're talking about peace with them, and then you want to give them jobs or, or ministries or whatever. So you, it's too early. <coughs> you don't want to undermine, actually, that there's the consensus among your own people by putting forward a peace plan that the other party may or may not uh, accept. But again, it does not mean that privately you should have a peace plan. You should prepare for scenarios. What if I propose this and they come up with that? This is something that, that's been done in, in Afghanistan by the government. Another thing that you hear actually a lot is that there's no military solution to a conflict. There is. There's always a military solution to a conflict if you can afford it. The best solution to any conflict is military. It's over by once, World War I, World War II. Over. But if you can afford it. If you can afford it or your enemy can afford it, there is a military solution. They either you take you out or you take him out. It's as simple as that. Of course. Now it gets to the second point that, it, uh, that you also hear about saying that you have to negotiate from a position of strength. Well, if I'm a position of strength, I'll take out the Taliban. If the Taliban are the position of strength, they'll take us out all. No, you enter into peace process because both sides are mutually weak. So this is a slogan. You have to negotiate from a position of strength. If we are in a position of strength, we will just take them out. If they are, if they have the forces, they will take us all out. So you enter into a peace process because of the position of the weakness on both sides or frustration. And the aim of this process is also to further weaken the other side. You're not entering into the process to empower the other side. You're entering into the peace process to weaken the other side. And, and they have also the same objective, to weaken you as part of the process. So uh, in a, of course, this is harder for the government. Keep in mind that a government would lose by not winning. Insurgency will win by not losing. So the position of the government is harder on that. And because, as I mentioned, if the government does not win, it's losing. If the, if the insurgency is not losing, it wins because they are there. That's all it takes. Their job is to destroy and distract. The government's job is to build and provide services. So that, that you are not an equal footing when it comes to this issue. And that's why when you enter into negotiation, you should recognize realistically that 
both sides are mutually weak. And also when you enter into the peace stop, you put a serious question on the other side. So since 2002, probably, there has been no meaningful discussions on that about with the Taliban about how the peace will look like for them. What is the income that they want to have actually out of that? And by putting this question forward, you are helping making them think about this position, but also weakening them. Because different elements in that, that the group that's called Taliban may have different objectives, different deliverables out of this war process in Afghanistan. So you would like them to start thinking at them, what do you want out of that? And where do you see yourself? And uh, another other question that is also interesting, I can compare my experience with that with Colombia, is how long the peace process will take. It takes longer, usually, traditional wisdom, Colombia and other, it takes longer than war process. But I think through my discussions and contacts, uh, that the peace process in Afghanistan, if it stops, Honestly, it's going to be a fast process. And, and why is this so? The reason is that if you compare IRA or FARC or many other actually similar peace process and, and other places, these were ideological groups. They were fighting for, for an ideology, for a system, for a governance system. And that's why it took longer. But, but what keeps Taliban united is war. That's it. And as I mentioned, like, since 2002, we didn't see any new plan we put forward as far as governance or, except for very general things, we want implementation of Sharia or where the foreign troops should go out. The, uh, outside this, we didn't see anything more specific. So what keeps Taliban United is war. And as soon as you start doubting, actually, the future of the war, Taliban will recognize that they lose ground quickly. And therefore, they will be actually interested, and I think for that reason, because there's no ideological basis for that struggle, the, 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 the peace process in Afghanistan will be fast. And this is also based on my, my contact with some of those elements that they think, well, if, if peace process starts rapidly, what's going to happen to us? They start thinking about their future. And, and this is good. And, and again, and the other thing is that if, you, if the only thing that keeps you united is war, or jihad, the way the Taliban call it, or whatever you call it, when you, when you start questioning that, when you start hearing about contacts between them and, 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 and Americans and, and, and Afghans and different capitals, it's harder to, to mobilize the foot soldiers. So, so you gotta go out and fight and get yourself killed and wear the suicide bomb while I'm going to Qatar and having actually an afternoon tea with my American colleagues. So it makes it difficult to mobilize actually the foot soldiers. That's why I think the process would be than comparing to other countries. And we, we also saw that in the last uh, ceasefire during the Eid holidays that took place. And again, um, Taliban allowed their soldiers to come to, 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 to the cities. Uh, they probably wanted to show a kind of a unity of command. Uh, and uh, But... Uh, but uh, the fact that their soldiers look like they, they are, they're missing actually their normal life like any other Afghan. They, will, they are more interested actually into peace than that made actually some of the Taliban leadership worry that if this, is, if this things get momentum, it will be harder actually to keep people uh, mobilized for, that, for, for the war. And uh, another question that I've been asked sometimes and, and I will be discussing here is well, we have not seen results. No, we will not be seeing results in a few months or a few years to come. Because the real objective of a peace process should be strategic. Should not cannot be tactical. You cannot have a peace agreement or a peace accord because there's an election coming up where the president of this or that country may like or dislike it. It's, it you have to have a strategic approach for that. If you want to do it for tactical reason, most probably it's not gonna fail. Or most probably it's gonna fail and it's not gonna deliver the objective. Another issue that has been discussed usually is where is a good thing to go about Islamabad, a neutral country, 
and it, where, where the discussion is. Of course, we prefer coal, Afghan, uh, of course, yes. and, and that relates also to who are the real stakeholders. But generally, we should understand that kind of venue shopping is part of the positioning for peace process. So they will be doing it. They will propose different venues. We will propose different venues. And our friends will propose venues because of their regional interest. So this part of the positioning, part of this process is, 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 is to gain actually uh, advantages by choosing a venue that is most advantageous. And this has happened in, all, in many uh, these processes that venue shopping is part of the, part of the positioning. And, and, but we, it, it will settle into one or, or more venues. And the role of other countries, uh, especially now that we see that countries in our neighborhood are getting more involved. First and foremost, this is the real stakeholder for this war is Afghan government elected by the Afghan people in the top. Secondary stakeholders are, are, are Americans and the Pakistan also. But then there's no substitute for the Afghan people and the Afghan government in this process. Of course, as part of his mission, as part of the positioning, Taliban says, no, we just, we just want to talk with America. And we, in the past, said, no, we just want to talk with Pakistan. Because that's, uh, you, 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 President doesn't, these are positioning issues. That's going to, that's going to, it's going to resolve. It's going to resolve. Because the, but as far as other countries playing a role as facilitator, as guarantor, as mediator, and that's welcome. And we've made it, it'll be clear in the past. If they want to act as such, as a mediator, as a facilitator, even as a guarantor, uh, uh, we will consider that. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> and um, the question of how to talk. Uh, again, I, I formulated some of the discussion in the form of a question, knowing that I'll be speaking with a student audience, and people who really would like to debate issues. How to talk. The best way to talk is to talk direct in cover. That's, that's how a real peace process will, will, will achieve the results that's needed. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, there are primary stakeholders, uh, Afghan and Taliban and others, but they can assist, but the real owner of this process should be these two players. And uh, it's premature, people ask, well, the government will tell them have a role in the government and all that. Again, hard to decide if they're interested. Yes, if they want to be the full government, I think, it, again, based on, on my contacts with them, they know that they cannot govern Afghanistan just by themselves. If, even if they want to govern Afghanistan by themselves, they cannot fund it. They can fund it probably through narcotics or some other dangerous means, but they learn the lessons when funding, when they're funding the government through means that led to their complete fall in 9-11 and other. So that's that's an understanding that, that, that to my context, that's obvious that more and more, uh, at least the, the, the guys that, 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 that they talk to, to me or to us, is they understand that they cannot govern by themselves. And even if they desire to govern by themselves, they know that they cannot fund this in a way that's sustainable. And uh, I, I've been asked also in the past, and said, well, but the Taliban said they're not talking, they're not coming, the US says, yes, we're talking, but we're not really talking, and, and all of that. But denial is part of this process, part of this game. Contacts are taking place at different levels. As I mentioned, talks are taking place at different levels, some effective, some not, since 2004. So. Don't be surprised if you, if you hear our Christian, especially publicly, that this, they said we do it, we don't do it, this country says we are not part of it, or we are part of it, fortunately, because somebody else asked us. You, you should make this process deniable, because when you enter into this process, the concern of the Taliban is that they lose, actually, the support of the foot soldier, if, if, if everybody sees that they are talking about peace. And, 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 and the concern of the Afghan government is that to, to lose the national consensus, I said, especially when, when, when Taliban has continued to, to carry out really brutal attacks in Kabul. He was saying, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Just today, 80 people were, were killed. So 
you should understand the concern of both sides if you want to if you want to work for the success of the process. And it's normal for both parties in any peace process to use proxies, to use real representative, to use decoys. That's that's how it's done. Uh, again, uh, a question that we usually ask is, who, who are you going to be talking to? Are the Taliban one unified movement, or there are different groups? It doesn't matter. If you want to talk to whoever is on the other side. Uh, again, if, if your objective of the peace process is to weaken the other side. Even sometimes people ask, should we talk to some extreme elements, say Akhani or even ISIS? If it helps weakening the, the other side, yes, I do. That's the objective. If, when you enter into peace process, their objective is not to keep us united. Our objective is not to keep them united. It's a practical approach. So that's why, and again, this issue of, I just totally understand the concern. Well, some of the groups are, are terrorists. They're, 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 they're religious extremists. And, uh, yes, the reality of the war is that you need to engage people. And keep in mind that when you start talking, every group was a terrorist to somebody at some time. Look at PLO, look at IRA, look, many others. How to compare them, actually, to some really religiously driven terrorists right now. But every group was a terrorist to somebody at some time. And so I, I only 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I think I am over that time. So I'll, I'll wrap up, actually, my, my discussion. Uh, I will really uh, uh, look forward to myself and my colleagues here to some recommendations, some more discussions discussion about the challenges ahead. But I, I just wanted to provide a platform about one of the most important issues for, for, for Afghanistan and our, uh, our close ally, uh, reconciliation and the challenges ahead. And also, give an understanding that it is going to be a, a uh, a long process. It's going to be processed by, by ups and downs, and it's going to be conflicting news, conflicting reports, uh, as I mentioned, denials of uh, acceptance, venues, change of venues, and other. That's, that's part of, of the game. I think overall there is a good, strong understanding and a commitment <coughs> by the Afghan government in us understanding by the Taliban that peace in peace process is the only way to, right now, in this condition, is the only way, probably not the best way. The only way to end actually that conflict, and it will, we will continue to work on it. I just wanted to give you uh, <coughs> a bedrock of how this peace and reconciliation generally flow, and, and why we are hearing actually sometimes conflicting reports or different reports about different issues. I really appreciate the interest. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, your Excellency, Lord Bruce, um, a very big thanks to Ajit Singh Satbambra and the Democracy Forum for hosting us here today on what is a truly um, difficult and complex topic. Um, I, I, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Dr. John Hemmings, the uh, director of the Asia Studies Center at the Henry Jackson Society. Um, it's funny, but I just come from a dinner last night on discussing a different peace process, and that's to do with North Korea, in which um, we also have a large number of states, uh, not as many non-state actors, um, but also a similarly uh, technical issue, an issue about sovereignty, an issue about security, and of course an issue about economic prosperity. Um, and if we look across the international relations spectrum, we can see, um, you know, if you're in negotiation, <laughs> you're doing really well right now. Uh, if you're dealing with U.S.-China trade issues, if you're dealing with the Taliban uh, peace process with the U.S. So, you know, reconciliation, negotiation, diplomacy, the art of diplomacy, all of these issues are more important now than ever. So whether you're a practitioner or a student of the region or a student of diplomacy, um, we hope that this will be a useful and interesting panel for you. Um, I'm humbled by my, my company here. I'm amongst um, four of...
some of the most impressive authorities on uh, either the regional context or uh, internal domestic context to Afghanistan's security situation. Um, we're going to do it in two chunks for you. Uh, we're going to have a kind of approach. The, the first session, which um, if you want to break it down, is really like a kind of external environment in which this peace process must occur, in which the various actors must all be consulted, um, and then an internal um, one, although I'm sure there will be a huge amount of overlap nonetheless. Um, I remember last night someone mentioned a quote that the North Korean issue is similar to a multi-tiered chessboard with overlapping boards with more than seven players. <laughs> I think we can agree that this issue I think has seven major powers and three international government organizations far uh, uh, trumps, if I may use that term, <laughs> trumps uh, the North Korean issue in some ways. Um, sitting on my immediate right, um, Dr. Barnett Rubin, the Associate Director uh, of the Center on International Cooperation at NYU, is someone who has had an incredibly useful, for the purpose of this panel, uh, career. He's from the very beginning of the bond process. He was the uh, special advisor to the Secretary General for Afghanistan during the negotiations. He has advised UNAMA. He has been uh, involved in the drafting of the Constitution of Afghanistan, uh, the Afghanistan Compact, and the Afghanistan National Development Strategy. So he will be first uh, speaking on the international context. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, following shortly after someone with uh, no less a uh, prestigious uh, background and career, uh, Emily Winter Botham, senior research fellow uh, on my left side, I should say, Royal, Royal United Services Institute, my old Alamanta, <laughs> Alamanta if I can say. Um, so she has had a long career uh, looking at extremism and radicalization uh, in the region, but she's also had a long career of reconciliation in the region. Um, between 2009 and 2015, she was in Afghanistan and Pakistan as political advisor for the European Union Special Representative. Um, she's also a friend of my, uh, a mutual friend of uh, ours who works um, specifically on his research was on negotiating with the Taliban uh, and different strategies. And so she will then follow uh, Dr. Rubin. So uh, Dr. Rubin, if I may first turn to you, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I think you didn't read the introduction handbook very well. Just just the lower expectations. That you look for. <laughs> but in any case, I want to thank uh, Lord Bruce and Ambassador Jawad for their introductory remarks. It made me feel perhaps my crossing the ocean was superfluous. But I shall have occasion to refer to them. Um, as I, uh, I I'm. Oh, actually, I wanted to ask you a question last time. Should I speak for 15 minutes or should I end at 2.45? <laughs> 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 uh, I think speak for, should we say 12 minutes and we'll, we'll just gently okay. curve off a little bit of the okay, book. That's want. fine. Okay. Yes. Um, so first, if I just may comment on a few of the points that Sai Tai Jawad made, by the way, we worked together quite a bit because well, at the time that I was advising the UN on the Afghan Constitution and the UN, the Afghan National Development Strategy, much of that time he was Chief of Staff to President Karzai, so we were in constant contact in Kabul in those days. Um, just uh, first, a point about plans. Um, remember, there's a military saying that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And that is true in peace as well as in war. However, General President Eisenhower said, plans are useless, but planning is essential. And that is what Ambassador Joao was referring to when he talked about scenarios. Because by planning, you acquaint yourself with different alternatives. Um, of course, in a negotiation, uh, just to elaborate on what he said, if, you, if one side proposes something too early, then the other side is obligated to reject it, even if it's something that they might actually agree to if, it, if they came to it through the course of negotiation. So you must remember that negotiation is above all a process, and it's a process of changing the relationships among the actors there. And it's not only, of course, everyone goes into it wanting to weaken the other side, 
But there's also a quest for mutual gain because uh, after all, everyone can, can, can win in some way from peace. Of course, you can win more than others. And that's, so it's a combination, it's not a zero sum game, but it's not just, well, it's not a entirely positive either. It, it, it's complex and that is why these games of uh, secrecy, uh, venue shopping and so on take place. Um, as far as success is concerned, there is a, a, a vast double standard in my experience in Washington is that if you have one meeting to negotiate and the peace does not result, then the summary of it is peace talks fail. Which actually, you could use that as a headline for all negotiations until the very last meeting. Because that is the way the negotiations work. And uh, if the military strategy is failing, then the head headline is, we need more troops. So uh, I, I'm not sure of the logic of that, but that's, that's the political logic. I hope we can reverse that. I, I think we are perhaps seeing it being reversed now. Now, let me say uh, a, f a few things um, about, I I'm going I'm to look at the international aspects of the conflict and go back historically a little bit. Unfortunately, that means I'm going to pass over some of the humanitarian issues, like the terrible massacres that have taken place in recent days, the repeated massacres of uh, Hazara in particular in both Afghanistan and in Pakistan, uh, the increasing number of casualties, and some of the positive elements, such as the growth of the People's Peace Movement, which whom I had the opportunity to speak when I was in Kabul in late June. But we can discuss all of that um, during the questions. Um, but. Uh, I would like to focus on a question that we haven't really raised so far, and which often gets neglected in these discussions, um, and that is, what will be the strategic position of Afghanistan after a peace agreement? And specifically, what will be the role of the United States and U.S. military forces and U.S. financial assistance to Afghanistan uh, after such an agreement? Because the war in Afghanistan did not start because of differences over, because of political differences between the Afghan government and the Taliban. There was no such Afghan government at the time, uh, and the Taliban were not overthrown before that reason. It was an international action. Um, so let me just, um, and the main demand of the Taliban, people have been asking, people have been asking, what did the Taliban want? The Taliban are pretty clear about what they want. They want the complete withdrawal of all foreign troops from Afghanistan. Of course, if you talk to them privately, they will give you nuances of what that means and under what conditions, but that is their fundamental publicly enunciated condition. That is also a position which to one extent or another has been adopted by many or most of the neighboring countries of Afghanistan. Uh, and that is one of the reasons that there is some convergence uh, of interests among those neighboring countries, not just Pakistan and the Taliban, on the question of opposing a long-term U.S. presence in Afghanistan and also in opposing, uh, as they, at least they claim to, Daesh at the Islamic State. Now, let me just make a few historical remarks. There's a basic reality which is usually left to the World Bank or IMF to kind of deal with, which, but which really is of fundamental political importance and does not get enough attention, which is Afghanistan defined as the current territory within the internationally recognized borders of Afghanistan has never been able to produce enough resources to fund its own state. Never. It has always relied on some kind of foreign assistance, especially in the military realm, and that is not as the Marxists used to say, it is no accident. Because Afghanistan was delimited by the British and the Russians in the late 19th, early 20th century to be a buffer state between their empires. And part of the, uh, the fact of being a buffer state is that it should be dependent on the British so that it was controllable. So it was set up, that's the reason for the, the point the Lord Bruce was talking about, the. Uh, Durand Line and the changes in the ter territory of Afghanistan, and I'm not here to say that changing that line or changing the territory will, will improve the situation, but um, that deprived Afghanistan of some of its most productive territories. And another part, so part of the agreement was losing those territories, another part was 
subsidies, especially military subsidies, to a highly centralized government to subdue all of the various people in the region, and an agreement between the British and the Russians that neither of them would have forces in Afghanistan or even originally diplomats. So that, because of course, the first and second Anglo-Afghan wars were partly set off by mutual suspicions and fears between the British and the Russians, which and then Afghan actors, of course, uh, actively participated in that and tried to uh, benefit from it, something which would uh, never happen today, of course. Um, so the, the state is, and now the state is even more dependent on foreign assistance, largely because two things. One is it is facing a much higher degree of threat uh, from its environment than it has in the past. And second, it is facing a much higher level of demand for social services from its population than it ever did in the past. And both of these, and these things are connected, they're both related to the social processes unleashed by this war, which has gone on not for 17 years, but for 40 years, and has resulted in many revolutionary changes whose consequences we are only starting to see. Now, that consensus about you know, keeping Afghanistan isolated broke down gradually over the years. It broke down finally in the mid-1970s, uh, for reasons I'm sure you're all familiar with. And that since then, we've had, roughly speaking, three periods. We had a period of Soviet hegemony in Afghanistan. We had a period of no hegemony in Afghanistan. Uh, and followed by a brief period of attempted Pakistani hegemony in Afghanistan. And then we had a period of U.S. hegemony in Afghanistan. Now, the first, the, the two obviously did not create stability because while the Soviets may have felt that they were bringing, trying to bring stability to Afghanistan, that created a security dilemma because others felt threatened by the way they were trying to bring stability to Afghanistan. And there was a huge global reaction as well as an Afghan reaction to it. Uh, during the period when there was no superpower involvement in Afghanistan, of course, basically the state collapsed. Uh, there was no army administration, and uh, it was unable to fund any of the 